ABC News Live. Tonight in Kyiv and on the world stage. The president makes a surprise appearance in Ukraine and with sirens blaring in the background, his message to Putin is clear. The U.S. stands with Ukraine. Plus... Did you see war crimes in Ukraine? Did you see Wagner soldiers commit war crimes? Public killings, torture, war crimes, and more. In our prime focus tonight, we hear from a defector of Russia's secretive mercenary group for the first time after escaping Putin's army. And this reminds me of a superhero movie that I was in, Bazoom, based on the Greek comic. Time, treasure every moment. From the silver screen, Broadway and broadcast TV to our very own studio, Jane Lynch sits down with us and talks about a television reunion 13 years in the making. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more tonight, including infections, headaches, and other after effects. What it's like for the people of East Palestine, Ohio, living within an area enveloped in a stench described as battery acid. We'll have a report from the ground. Plus, we're in Georgia with a check on the health of Jimmy Carter as the 39th president rests as he enters hospice care at home. And exactly one week after a mass shooting at Michigan State University, the school is opening back up what the students are saying about the lasting impact that shooting will have. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we do begin with the president making that unprecedented visit to Ukraine. Biden made the high stakes trip without advance notice to show solidarity with Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky as we approach one year since Russia began its invasion. Biden is the first president since FDR to visit a war zone in Europe, and he becomes the first president to visit a war zone without a U.S. military presence on the ground. As he told the world, quote, freedom is priceless. It's worth fighting for for as long as it takes. And tonight we are learning new details about this high stakes trip and the secretive journey it took from the U.S. to Ukraine, including a 10 hour overnight train ride from Poland into Kyiv. Our senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce leads us off tonight from Poland. President Biden tonight arriving back in Poland after making history in Ukraine. The first American president in modern times to visit a war zone where the U.S. has no military presence. The trip shrouded in secrecy. Biden slipping out of Washington early Sunday under the cover of darkness. Flying not on Air Force One, but on a small C-32, its blinds drawn. Once in Poland, the president whisked to a nearby train, where for 10 hours he traveled undetected into the heart of Ukraine. Arriving in Kyiv early this morning, the city streets blocked off for the surprise visitor. President Zelensky and his wife waiting for him. Good morning, Mr. President. Welcome. That handshake a sign of an unbreakable bond. This is my eighth trip. Give everyone a more significant. This is your stay. The president sharing a message with the Ukrainian people, writing, I am honored to be welcomed again in Kyiv to stand in solidarity and friendship. What can I say? I really appreciate that President Biden, American society, being from the very beginning of this tragedy, from the very beginning of this full-scale war, from the first days being together with us. Biden saying he wanted to make this trip to show and not just tell the world that America's support for Ukraine is unwavering. I thought it was critical that there not be any doubt, none whatsoever, about U.S. support for Ukraine in their war against the brutal attack by Russia. Then something that not long ago would have been unthinkable. Biden and Zelensky walking together through the free streets of Kyiv, the same streets Vladimir Putin was closing in on just a year ago. One year later, Kyiv stands and Ukraine stands. Democracy stands. The Americans stand with you. The two leaders visiting St. Michael's Monastery. As they exit, a harsh reminder of the realities of life in this war-torn city. Those air raid sirens blaring, a warning to take cover. But the leaders defiant, continuing their tour, visiting the Wall of Remembrance, honoring the Ukrainian lives lost in the fight against Russian aggression, taking in a moment of silence 
pierced by those sirens. The risk of this trip weighed heavily on the White House. After assessing the danger for weeks, the president Friday giving the go-ahead. Russia, we're told, was informed of Biden's visit just hours beforehand, an attempt to avoid any potential miscalculation or further conflict. Today, before he left, a promise. Remind us that freedom is priceless. It's worth fighting for for as long as it takes. And that's how long we're going to be with you, Mr. President, for as long as it takes. We'll do it. Thank you. Uh, Biden says the U.S. is in it for the long haul. Mary Bruce joins us now from Warsaw. And Mary, President Biden is now preparing to deliver a major speech in Poland tomorrow. I understand Vladimir Putin will also be speaking tomorrow to the Russian people. What can we expect from both? Well, this is going to be quite a split screen moment, that is for sure. The president tonight was actually seen working on this address, putting the finishing touches on his speech aboard the train as he made his way out of Ukraine. This is really a pivotal moment for him to try and persuade our allies to keep up this fight. The president today already announcing an additional $500 million in military assistance for Ukraine. It's the kind of aid he will argue that needs to continue. But this speech tomorrow is also really a chance to try and shore up support back at home. As Lindsay, we've seen those polls showing that U.S. interest in this war is starting to wane. Right, dwindling a little bit there. And Mary, give us a little color from this roughly 36-hour secretive trip from takeoff in the U.S. to arrival back in Poland. There were only two journalists who went with the president, and Biden spent nearly 20 hours on his favorite mode of transportation, a train. Yeah, Amtrak Joe, I'm sure, uh, enjoying this ride, but a train ride unlike any he has ever experienced before, that is for sure. Ten hours in, ten hours out. Uh, the president taking this trip in near darkness, surrounded by a very small team and a lot of security, as you can imagine. You mentioned just those two journalists accompanying him. They were also shrouded in secrecy throughout this whole process. In fact, they were given details in an email that was uh, addressed with the subject line, arrival instructions for the golf tournament as if they were arriving at Andrews Air Force Base for this secret departure simply to watch a golf game. Throughout all of this, they had to hand over their communication, their cell phones, all of their devices, all of this to keep the president safe so that he could make this historic visit. Lindsay. Mary Bruce on the ground for us tonight in Warsaw. Thanks so much, Mary. President Biden's surprise visit comes the day before Russian President Vladimir Putin is expected to deliver his annual State of the Nation address. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel is in Kyiv. Ian, is there any indication of how Putin might respond? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the response to Biden's visit, I think, was fairly muted, apart from people like former President Dmitry Medvedev. He was claiming that Russia gave Joe Biden security guarantees, calling him the old man from over the ocean, swearing allegiance to a neo-Nazi regime. But remember, the Kremlin frames this war as a battle against America and the West. So in some senses, President Biden's visit here to Kyiv reinforces that. Tomorrow, it will be, though, a battle of the two presidents. First, Putin with the State of the Nation address. He's going to talk about the war, which he still, of course, calls a special military operation. I think all eyes are going to be on whether he reacts to Biden's visit and whether or not he doubles down on the invasion, which, of course, many people fear. A few hours later, all eyes on that speech by President Biden from Poland. So you've got these two leaders with two starkly different worldviews. Tonight, with Biden promising more weapons for Ukraine, Ukrainian officials saying that feared Russian offensive has already begun. Lindsay. And Ian, you've of course covered conflicts for decades. What kind of impact could a visit like President Biden's into the war zone have on the Ukrainian soldiers fighting on the front lines? Uh, I think it has a huge impact on the morale of the entire nation. Now, uh, I suspect if you're down there in the trenches in somewhere like Bakhmut, where the fighting is absolutely terrible, you're probably not aware that President Biden has already come to the country. I think you're more focused on staying alive. But, of course, what it means is the messaging that America and the West will continue to support Ukraine. And in practical terms, if you are down there in the trenches on the front line, it's that physical support that makes all the difference. At the moment, Ukrainian troops are low on ammunition, they're out, uh, outflanked in terms of numbers of people that they're facing, and also outgunned by the Russian guns. So they're very clear on what kind of weapon systems they want. So President Biden coming here, of course, sends a very important sort of uh, message to the nation. It boosts morale, uh, it, uh, it stiffens resolve. But I think in a practical terms, it also has to lead to something 
tangible on the battlefield that will allow them to try and change this dynamic as the Russians press their offensive. Vladimir Putin, of course, hoping to claim some kind of victory by the anniversary at the end of the week. I don't know that that's going to happen, but they may well say, for example, they've claimed Bakhmut even if they've only got a foothold there. Lindsay? Ian, panel for us in Kyiv. Ian, thank you. Our coverage from Ukraine continues. In just a few minutes, we'll talk with the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. And we have an in-depth report on Russia's shadow mercenary group, which is now operating with as many as 50,000 fighters inside Ukraine, including 40,000 convicts. Next tonight to Georgia, where we've learned that former President Jimmy Carter is now receiving hospice care, announcing a decision to spend his remaining time at home with his family after a series of recent health issues. Here's Steve Osinsami. He is the longest living American president in history at 98 years old, well into the sunset of his life. But his announcement over the weekend was still surprising that former President Jimmy Carter has decided to spend his remaining time at home with his family and receive hospice care instead of additional medical intervention. This is a former president who could have retired to a comfortable life, but instead chose to fly around the world with the former first lady, ending diseases, encouraging free elections, and building houses for the poor, even when he hurt his eye after a fall at their home. I had a number one priority, and that was to come to Nashville to build houses. His family tonight says he's recently had a series of short hospital stays, but it's unclear if it's related to the skin cancer that he fought for years. And as if to tell the world that he's never leaving, after every health concern or rumor, he would appear at parades in his hometown, looking right into the cameras. He's just touched so many lives. Every single time I have interfaced with him, he always said two things to me. Thank you for what you're doing to make the world a better place. And what can I do to support you? No doubt this will be a difficult part of their journey together for the former first lady. And what will now likely be his final television interview, he told me on their 75th wedding anniversary that she was the son in his day. What advice do you have for people who want to make it last? Well, let me take the first step. First of all, choose the right person to marry. Having Rosen staying with me all this long has been the most wonderful thing in my life. He's pretty wonderful in my life, too. A real love story there. And let's get right to Steve Osinsami in Georgia. And Steve, what can you add about this decision by former President Carter? Well, I can tell you that the type of care that he is getting is different from the type of end-of-life care that someone sees when they have an acute illness, when they have a very serious illness. Instead, this is end-of-life care that provides comfort and reduces pain when necessary. And I will tell you, we're at the Carter Center now. We've talked with a number of the people here. All of them have stories, in, including this person who had a beautiful story that shared, they shared with us about their experience with the former president. Um, so I'd been at the Carter Center for some time and wanted to become a mom, and I wasn't able to otherwise, mm -hmm. and so decided to adopt my daughter. And in doing an adoption, you need to have all kinds of references and oh. letters of support. And so when President Carter heard that I was going through this adoption process, he reached out and asked if he could do a letter of support for me. Oh. And so he wrote a letter to help me um, adopt my daughter and, and bring her home and he was one of the first people who met her we came here to the carter center after yeah. she came home and he and mrs carter um came out to the to the rotunda to meet her and to hold her and and to and and knew her throughout her life yeah. so there are all kinds of prayers that are going up for the former president tonight and for his wife. I will say that his one of his grandsons visited the home over the weekend and said that his grandparents are at peace and in a home full with love. Lindsay. All right. We so appreciate those little stories we've been hearing. Steve, our thanks to you. In Los Angeles, two days after a man was charged with federal hate crimes for allegedly shooting and wounding two victims leaving a synagogue, authorities have announced that they've made an arrest in another shooting in the murder of an auxiliary bishop. Bishop David O'Connell was shot and killed in his home. He served the Archdiocese of Los Angeles for 45 years. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has the latest. Tonight, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department saying they have a suspect in custody in connection with the shocking murder of a beloved Catholic bishop, David O'Connell. 
The person of interest was identified as Carlos Medina, a 65-year-old male Hispanic. This is the husband of the bishop's housekeeper, and the suspect had previously done work around the bishop's residence. The suspect's home raided by SWAT teams overnight. On Saturday afternoon, the 69-year-old was found murdered in his bed at his home in Hacienda Heights, about 20 miles east of Los Angeles. A single gunshot wound to his chest. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Originally from Ireland, O'Connell was ordained to serve the L.A. Archdiocese in 1979, working extensively with the immigrant community, serving as chairman of a task force coordinating help for immigrant families from Central America. You want to have justice and peace for all races of people. He was known for his sense of humor and as a peacemaker. Parishioners stunned by the news. He's just a beautiful human being. It's just hard to believe anybody would even consider her hurting him in any way. So many of those parishioners so distraught. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, what led authorities to the suspect? A combination of factors, Lindsay. On the one hand, L.A. County Sheriff said that it was good police work, but they also got a critical tip from the public. A caller saying that the suspect had been acting erratically, had been talking about the bishop, saying the bishop owed him money, uh, but no word yet from the sheriff or any investigators so far about a possible motive here. Lindsay. Matt Gutman for us. Thanks so much, Matt. Tragedy struck once more in two counties that were barely starting to recover after another major earthquake uh, rocked already devastated areas of Turkey and Syria. The 6.4 quake hit after dark, sending people running into the streets, bringing down more buildings and reviving the terror they've experienced for two weeks now. Here's Marcus Moore. Tonight, another deadly earthquake in Turkey, toppling buildings, exactly two weeks after the region suffered one of the most devastating quakes in modern history. The ground shaking violently around 8 p.m. local time. Neighborhoods yet again plunged into darkness. Is she a public mission? Local politician bolting from a building mid-interview. During their report, these journalists grabbing each other's arms. Rescuers with flashlights making their way through the night in a landscape already blighted. The air soon filling with dust from collapsed buildings nearby. Tonight's tremor, a 6.3 magnitude quake compared to 7.8 on February 6th, both right along Turkey's border with Syria. The death toll from that initial quake now at nearly 47,000. In recent days, our team witnessing firsthand the brave rescuers not giving up desperate to find survivors more than a week later under the mountain of concrete. <laughs> Citizens this evening taking no chances, running from their potentially compromised apartment buildings for the relative safety of the streets, building fires to keep them warm. Families distraught at having lost so much already, fearing they could lose even more. Marcus Moore joins us now. Uh, Marcus, just tell us about the amount of devastation there so far. Well, Lindsay, the, the devastation is significant according to the reports that we received tonight. Uh, we know that, that sadly at least three people have lost their lives and there are hundreds who are injured and the mayor of one town says that there are people trapped tonight under the rubble of newly collapsed buildings. Lindsay. Wow, they're going to be looking for survivors once again there. Marcus Moore, our thanks to you. Classes are now back in session at Michigan State University one week after an on-campus shooting killed three students and injured five others. Grief counselors and police were on campus today as in-person classes once again resumed, though many students expressed anxiety and fear as they returned. In an op-ed from the university's newspaper, a staffer writes that our school is broken, our home is destroyed. They add that students need time to process and that every possible accommodation must be made. Four students wounded in the shooting remain in critical condition. MSU police are still investigating the motive for the rampage. A record 6,542 guns were intercepted in airports across the country country in 2022. That's according to the TSA, confiscating the weapons at airport checkpoints from coast to coast. That's roughly 18 guns a day, and it's all-time high with the exception of 2020. The number of weapons intercepted at airport checkpoints has climbed every year since 2010. The TSA has been using federal fines of up to $15,000 to punish those who bring a gun through a checkpoint, but that has not stopped the numbers of weapons. Experts and officials say the rise in gun interceptions simply correlates to more Americans carrying guns. 
To a development today in the lawsuit against Alec Baldwin in the Rust shooting, the Santa Fe District Attorney announced today the office has dropped the gun enhancement charges against the actor. If he had been convicted on those charges, it could have carried a five-year sentence for Baldwin in the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The charge was also dropped for armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. Baldwin is still facing a civil lawsuit on behalf of the family of Hutchins, and he faces an involuntary manslaughter charge that carries a lesser sentence of 18 months. The DA said in a statement that the prosecutor Prosecution's priority is securing justice, not securing billable hours for big city attorneys. The decision to drop the gun charge is considered a win for Baldwin, who makes his first court appearance this Friday. Now to growing fears in East Palestine, Ohio, after the train derailment and toxic spill more than two weeks ago, residents are now saying they're feeling ill, headaches, eye illnesses, and more. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi is on the ground for us in Ohio. More than two weeks after that train derailment unleashed toxic chemicals in East Palestine, Ohio, crews today dismantling those cars just steps away from Shelby Walker's home. Like many people here, she doesn't believe officials who insist the air and water are safe. We don't drink the water at all. Um, we don't bathe in the water. We do shower very quick. And with 11 people in the family, Shelby says they can't afford to leave. We just don't have the means to do it or we would have been gone by now. 11-year-old Zach lives near the tracks, too, but his family is staying at a hotel. Ever since that incident happened, our face has been burning, and it's really bad. Some residents say they felt sick for days, from headaches to sore throats. Starting tomorrow, this church turns into a new health clinic where residents can see nurses and a toxicologist. Over the weekend, the head of Norfolk Southern meeting with local leaders. I'm here to support the community. The railway company now reimbursing residents for expenses and putting a million dollars into a recovery fund. But Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg accusing the rail companies of raking in profits while spending millions to fight safety regulations in a letter, writing, quote, Norfolk Southern and your industry must demonstrate that you will not seek to supercharge profits by resisting higher standards. Mona joins us now. And Mona, that health clinic is opening tomorrow and they're already getting a lot of calls by people who want to be evaluated? That's right, Lindsay. They started fielding calls at 8 a.m. this morning from locals and even people from across the state line in Pennsylvania. But right now we're be being told that they are prioritizing the residents of East Palestine. Lindsay. Mona Kosar Abdi. Mona, thank you. Still much more ahead to get to coming up a deadly gator attack. Witnesses describe how the terrifying incident unfolded. The next once in the shadows, a Russian mercenary group is now at the forefront of the war in Ukraine, accused of atrocities on the front lines. Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S. weighs in as we take a deeper look into the group with one of its defectors in tonight's prime focus. You saw personally members of Wagner execute other soldiers in front of you. Был случай, видел, привезли двоих человек на полигоне, стреляли личным путем. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Tonight, there's a growing push here in the U.S. to label a secretive Russian mercenary group operating in Ukraine as a terrorist organization. The group has an estimated tens of thousands of convicts fighting with it. If any troops trying to desert, they may be killed. Our Patrick Rival spoke with a defector who made his way out of Ukraine and wants the world to know what the Wagner group is doing there. They've become a byword for brutality in Ukraine, the Wagner Group. The Russian private military company owned by a top ally of Vladimir Putin. Once in the shadows, operating in as many as 30 countries, now they're at the forefront of the Kremlin's war. Andrei Medvedev escaped Russia in January. He's now under protection in Norway. Medvedev was once part of the estimated 50,000 Wagner fighters in Ukraine, a platoon leader for the mercenary group. When you were in Ukraine, you saw personally members of Wagner execute other soldiers in front of you. He says such killings of Wagner troops were routine for those refusing to fight. Did you see war crimes in Ukraine? Did you see Wagner soldiers commit war crimes? Wagner has threatened to kill defectors. Are you afraid for your safety? Last year, a video circulated online seemed to show Wagner members executing a former comrade they accused of surrendering. The man put against a wall and then appearing to be struck with a sledgehammer repeatedly. Wagner was founded by Yevgeny Prigozhin, an oligarch close to Russian President Vladimir Putin. A former caterer for Kremlin events, he's often nicknamed Putin's chef. Also wanted by the FBI for his role in meddling in the 2016 presidential election. Before the war, Wagner operated as a semi-covert force for the Kremlin, from Syria to the Central African Republic. But in Ukraine, Wagner swelled into an army within an army. Now playing a key role in the battle for Bakhmut, Wagner's been allowed to recruit convicts from Russia's prisons. The US estimates of its 50,000 members fighting in Ukraine right now, 40,000 are convicts. Video from last September shows Wagner's founder personally addressing hundreds of inmates at a prison in central Russia. He promises the men a pardon if they survive fighting for six months. Denis Yaroslavsky has faced Wagner troops in eastern Ukraine. He says the prisoners are sent in waves in frontal assaults. На сегодняшний день ЧВК Вагнер использует тактику тысяч тел. Они набирают заключенных, которые даже по законодательству Российской Федерации еще не отбыли срок заключения под стражей, то есть они осуждены, но не отбыли срок. Они набирают их из тюрьмы, набирают их десятками тысяч, в прямом смысле слова, подписывают с ними контракты и необученных заключенных отправляют умирать в Украину. Ukraine's military estimates Wagner is suffering thousands of casualties. Footage shows dozens of fresh graves dug near Wagner's base in southern Russia. На сегодняшний день, с учетом того, что Вагнер использует необученных заключенных, фактически мы их даже не допускаем до огневого контакта. 
Их уничтожаем дистанционно артиллерией на подходе к Бахмуту. Я уверен, что их погибли уже десятки тысяч. Я уверен, что их просто никто не считает. Вот вообще никто не считает. Когда вы сидите на диванах... Пригожин сказал, что Вагнер не прекратит больше призывов для сейчас. The U.S. has designated Wagner a significant transnational criminal organization and brought fresh sanctions against it. Experts say Prigozhin's influence in the Kremlin has also soared because of the war. I think that ЧВК Wagner on today's day is obliged to take terrorist organization number one, and Prigozhin is equal to Bin Laden, because that is how it is. But in addition to Bin Laden, there is a Prigozhin in the way to the commander and the first officer of the army of Russia in Kremlin, во все властные кабинеты, к технологиям. Russia's relentless war in Ukraine, bringing this once shadowy group front and center. Этой войны не должно быть. Страдает народ от этого. Я бы мог свою жизнь спасти, сидя в тайге где-нибудь в Сибири, прятаться в какой-нибудь деревне старовером. Нашел в себе силу, дух нашел и решил все-таки выступить против этого всего. Our thanks to Patrick Rivel, and I want to welcome Oksana Markarova, Ukraine's ambassador to the United States. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. We'll get to President Biden's historic visit, uh, meeting with President Zelensky, uh, but we just had a report about the Wagner Group, a private Russian military company serving as mercenaries in the war. Uh, we talked to a defector who said that fighters are, are thrown into the front lines like, quote, meat, and who witnessed executions for some who refused to fight. He also said that he believes the Wagner Group is committing war crimes, are they? Well, it's all Russians on Ukrainian territory committing war crimes, whether it's Wagner Group or the uh, armed formations of the Russian Federation. They have nothing to do to be on the territory of the sovereign country. They all definitely committed crime of starting and, and doing the aggression. And we've seen all these atrocities in Bucha, Irpin, Izum, Kherson, you know, you name it. So uh, I'm positive that if he is part of Wagner Group, that yes, Wagner Group is committing atrocities, but they are not the only ones. Uh, that secret trip by President Biden to stand side by side with President Zelensky in Kyiv comes just days before the one-year mark in this war. You tweeted this image of the U.S. and Ukrainian flags in the shape of a heart. How significant is what happened today? It meant a lot for Ukrainian people to see President Biden in Kyiv meeting with our president walking through the streets, paying tribute to Heavenly Hundred. Today is a very special day for us when we recall all the people who were killed uh, during Maidan, you know, when in 2014, Ukraine fought for our independence from Russian-operated uh, uh, Ukrainian regime, uh, essentially, which led uh, to, to this war and uh, which started in 2014 when Russia attacked us for the first time. So it's a great sign of support. It's a very brave move of American president, and we really appreciate and value it. The White House did alert Russia to Biden's visit ahead of time, but, but you could still hear air sirens as the two leaders walked through the capital. Talk a little bit about the threat of attack that Ukrainians live under each and every day. Every day, you know, the, the missiles fall in any places, whether it's hospital or residential area, the energy infrastructure is destroyed. And I will remind you that still a lot, a large portion of Ukrainian territory is under illegal occupation, where people have been killed, tortured, Ukrainian children have been abducted into Russia. It is a full-fledged war we didn't see since the World War II. So it is very risky, and we cannot trust Russians. I mean, even when they promise something, remember for Christmas, Mr. Putin was talking about some kind of uh, quiet time for Christmas. And right after he said that, there was a lot of shelling everywhere in Ukraine. President Biden called Russian President Vladimir Putin, quote, dead wrong to think that Russia could outlast Ukraine and your Western allies. Uh, Putin delivers his State of the Nation address tomorrow. Oh, what do you think that his message might be? And, and do you think that he'll respond likely directly to Biden's visit? Well, frankly, we do not care, and I think it's it's about time to stop thinking what he will say and focus on what we together not only will say but do. So um, today's visit was a great visit to discuss weapons, to discuss security assistance, to discuss financial assistance, to discuss, to discuss more strong sanctions, everything that we have to do together in order to win together and in order to get to just peace together.
You were a guest, of course, of Dr. Jill Biden at last year's State of the Union address, as well as this year's. Some noted that the attention the war received, both in the president's remarks and from lawmakers in the chamber, was less pronounced this year. Are you concerned about dwindling support? Absolutely not. I think, you know, the first address was on the sixth day of this aggression when President Biden needed to explain to American people what is it about and why it is important for all of us. This year it is different. American people do support this fight because American people understand how important it is for everyone who believes in the same values of freedom, democracy, the sacredness of our homes. So I think President Biden has been very clear in his message in this year's State of the Union that United States is with us. It no longer requires explanations. Uh, we are together. American people support us. We just have to stay the course and do a little bit more to finish this job and win while this fight is still in Ukraine. Ambassador, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Later in the show, we'll speak with Nobel Peace Prize winner Maria Ressa about her reporting on alleged human rights abuses in the Philippines, the consequences that she's faced, and what she thinks about the future of democracy in America. Still much more ahead to get to here on Prime coming up. Actress Jane Lynch tells us why she decided to return for a reboot of a fan favorite TV show along with a newer hit series. But next, President Biden's visit to Ukraine marks a first in history. We take a look at presidential trips to war zones by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're Friday. making magic. America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back, everyone. President Biden's surprise visit to Ukraine today was the first time in modern history a U.S. president has visited a war zone that was not under U.S. military control. Here's a look at past presidential trips to a war zone by the numbers. In 1943, President Franklin D. Roosevelt visited Allied military installations in Italy. President Lyndon B. Johnson made two trips to Vietnam to visit U.S. troops. And Richard Nixon visited Vietnam once, meeting with the South Vietnamese president as well as U.S. troops. President George W. Bush made four trips to Iraq and two trips to Afghanistan. President Barack Obama also spent time in the Iraq and Afghanistan war zones with one trip to Iraq and four to Afghanistan. President Donald Trump made one trip to Iraq and one to Afghanistan as well. But President Abraham Lincoln is the only president to come under direct enemy fire in a battle. In 1864, he ventured out to witness the Confederate attack on Fort Stevens in Washington, D.C. Lincoln famously clambered up on the Fort's top to get a better view of things, and when Confederate troops spotted the six-foot-plus president, they opened fire, wounding a Union surgeon standing just a few feet away. And much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The feature Facebook and Instagram users will soon be paying for, and he's only played in two games in the NBA, but a recent performance has some calling him a slam dunk legend. Plus, my sit down with a comedic living legend, Jane Lynch, right after the break. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're baby. making magic. rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charged in a sweeping 56 count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not going to let that happen on our watch. Not with hip hop music, using our lyrics. We're going to fight back. Rap, trap, hip hop on trial. Only on Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. The man accused of killing a police officer makes an appearance in court. The investigation into a deadly gator attack in Florida and the feature that some Facebook and Instagram users will soon have to pay for those stories and much more in tonight's rundown.
In Philadelphia, a suspect is in custody in the wake of the fatal Saturday night shooting of a Temple University police officer identified as Chris Fitzgerald. A statement released earlier from Temple officials said the officer was shot while trying to apprehend the suspect in a robbery. In his arraignment today, among the charges 18-year-old Miles Pfeiffer faces is murder of an officer. Authorities say Pfeiffer shot Officer Fitzgerald following a struggle, then stood over him, shooting him several more times. He allegedly carjacked a vehicle after the shooting and reportedly told police he melted the gun used in the murder. Authorities use surveillance video to track him down. At the end of the day, although we wear the uniform as police officers, the commonality is that we're all human beings. You know, we laugh, uh, and in this instance, uh, we're, we're hurting, we're crying. A deadly alligator attack under investigation in Fort Pierce, Florida. Authorities say an 85-year-old woman died walking her dog near her home. Police say the 10-foot gator lunged out of the water and grabbed her. The alligator later captured. The victim's body has been recovered. A deadly mass shooting Sunday night caused chaos at a parade in New Orleans leading up to Mardi Gras. Investigators say one teenager is dead and four other people were wounded, including a young girl. The gunfire broke out during the Bacchus Parade. A 21-year-old was quickly apprehended and two weapons were confiscated. No word yet on a motive. We had no problems until this incident happened, and we do not want another incident like this to spoil the rest of our Mardi Gras season. A change is coming to Instagram and Facebook. Users will soon need to pay if they want to become a verified account. It's a move that follows in Twitter's footsteps. CEO Mark Zuckerberg says the new subscription service is aimed at improving security. For $11.99 a month, you'll get a blue verified badge and direct access to customer support. The program rolls out this week in Australia, launching in the U.S. a little bit later this year. Good news in the battle against HIV AIDS. Researchers in Germany have announced that a 53-year-old man has been cured of HIV. Referred to as the Dusseldorf patient to protect his privacy, he has no detectable virus in his body after stopping his medication now for over four years. He joins a small group who've been cured after stem cell transplant, which is typically only performed on cancer patients who don't have any other options. The Lincoln Memorial is about to undergo a major renovation. Jeff Reinbold with the National Park Service says it will improve the below ground level of the memorial, adding exhibit space dedicated to the former president. Well, most people don't know that there is a space underneath the Lincoln Memorial, and so the chance to not only introduce them to that undercroft space, but also to tell the story of how this memorial was created, some of the symbolism that's in it, but most importantly, the meanings that it has taken on over time. The project should be completed in 2026. She's been dominating Hollywood for decades, earning five primetime Emmy Awards along the way. And Jane Lynch is returning to her role in the cult classic series, Party Down. Lynch is known for iconic performances like Sue Sylvester and Glee, Two and a Half Men, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, the film 40-year-old version. We could go on and on. Now Lynch is reprising her role as Constance in the show about Los Angeles catering waiters who have Hollywood aspirations. Let's take a look. No personal business on company. Ah, group photo. Okay, get the whole gang. Weren't we the gang and you were more management? Now it's a party down reunion. Um, just yes. what everyone's dying for. <laughs> this is no joke. <laughs> this is catering. Hey, are we having fun yet? Looks like a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Jane Lynch in the building. Thank you so much. So, so many people are excited about this returning 10 years after it first yep. aired. Many of the original cast and crew returning. What made this the right time to get the band back together? Because stars said yes this time. <laughs> we have been asking since we ended the series, 2000, what was it, about 11 or 12 or something like that. And um, so we thought we were going to make a movie at one point. And then we thought we were going to be on television at one point, and they all went away. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, Rob Thomas, our, our director, uh, our, our producer and director, uh, emailed all of us personally and said, are you available during this chunk of time? And we all said yes. And so it happened. Stars said yes. I think they may have asked us. The stars aligned. Yeah, yeah, the stars <laughs> aligned for stars and party down. And, and so you initially left this in order to go do Glee. I did. How did this role prepare you for that and, and beyond? Well, it's an ensemble comedy. That's what I love about Party Down. It's not about one person, it's about all of us. And it was one of those things like lightning in a bottle. We were like 
bub bubbles of carbonation. It really, really worked. And then going to Glee, again, another ensemble comedy. So, and, and even before that, I had done uh, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Talladega Nights, the Christopher Guest films. They're all comedy ensembles. And I tend to get that job. And it's my favorite thing in the world. I never wanted to be out there alone. I love being with other people and playing off of them and being part of a group. It, one, one note in accord. <laughs> Ryan Hansen recently said to the New York Times, it felt so close to home, this show, because I felt like I could be a caterer the next day easily. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for aspiring actors, people who are working by day, hoping that it's going to pay off ultimately on the big screen? Well, you have to love it. You don't have to love catering, but you do have to love acting. Um, and if you don't, it's a real hard uh, a road to hoe. Um, I think for all of us, because we all were, I, I was probably the oldest, but everybody else was pretty young and hadn't, you know, made it big. For them, he was absolutely right. You know, they were, they could easily go back to catering. And I couldn't do it because I, I, I was too old to be a caterer. But um, so it was for us at that time, for most of us, uh, uh, you know, a, a first job. And, um, you know, the sh we made it in isolation. We kind of made it in a bubble. And when it came out, nobody watched it. <laughs> so we were kind of this gem that people found s on streaming. So we were really, really happy when it became resurrected and, and uh, people liked it. How about the marvelous Mrs. Maisel? Will we see you in the upcoming f uh, season finale? Yes, I am in one scene. And, uh, oh, there she is. Uh, oh, my gosh, is that beautiful? Look at that outfit and look at that set. <laughs> this, this show, the best writing... The, the 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 best sets, the best costumes, the best music, the best the best producers and Amy and Dan. I mean, look, isn't that just it's like a freaking painting. <laughs> just really gorgeous. Is. We can ah, appreciate that. You're right. The costume is is really a, a work of art. It is. You have such a range, you know, not only do you do TV and films and write books, but uh, game show host. Yeah. How, what's the secret sauce? How do you stay so relevant and, and so consistent? Well, I don't try to stay relevant <laughs> and I don't try to stay consistent. I like to do a lot of different things and it turns out I get uh, um, asked to do a lot of different things. I get asked to a lot of different parties and I love it. I'm doing a, um, a two person show with Kate Flannery, uh, who was married at the drunk in the office. And we, um, it's called Two Lost Souls and we're going all over the country singing together and that that's a lot of fun too so i do a lot of different things paul rudd meryl streep recently joined the cast yeah. of only murders in the building will you be returning i as will well? i'm coming back to new york in about two weeks to shoot my episode so i'm thrilled what's next i mean it seems like you have so much going on in the pipeline i don't know you know it it, it will be revealed to me oh, i think okay. anytime i plan you know, oh, I'd like to do this next. It never works. Something comes out of left field. And I go, oh, I guess that's what I'm doing. So hopefully, you know, it's something has always shown up. So hopefully that trend will continue. But for right now, I have no idea. But you're busy. And as I say, what man plans, God laughs. No, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Jane Lynch, we thank you so much. We want our viewers to know that you can watch Party Down on Friday, February 24th on Stars at 9 p.m. Eastern. As we celebrate Black History Month, we want to feature an incredible group of gymnasts making their mark on the mat. The young women at Fisk University, a historically black college and university, they are leading the charge and changing the face in the sport, one all-around championship win at a time. These Fisk University ladies are leaping into history, turning the world of gymnastics on its head as the first ever gymnastics team repping a historically black college and university. Stop it. I have always wanted to go to an HBCU and do the sport that I love. Freshman Morgan Price was a five-star recruit who committed to SEC Powerhouse Arkansas. But she changed her plans last year after learning that Fisk was launching a team. When Fisk came out with the first HBC gymnastics team, I knew that I wanted to be a part of it. To be able to like have 15 other girls who look like me share the same connections as me is just super cool. One, two, three. The close-knit group is led by head coach Kareen Tarver. We're the first. We're the blueprint. So, yeah, there's, there's times when I'm up at night <laughs> panicking a little bit, going, oh, my gosh, this, we got to make this work. This, this has to happen. Coach Tarver knows all about breaking barriers. 34 years ago, she became the first black gymnast to win the NCAA all-around title. Beautiful. Another trailblazer from that era. 
Three-time Olympian Dominique Dawes. Awesome Dawson, of course, was a member of the Magnificent Seven, that legendary 1996 Olympic squad that captured team gold in Atlanta. Earlier this past year, Serena Williams did mention that she had watched me, and I was an inspiration for her. And again, that's humbling um, that I could inspire people. These days, Dawes runs her own gymnastics academy. She's quick to point out her predecessors, like Lucy Collins and Diane Durham. Nice. Yet Dawes says the sport historically put black gymnasts at a disadvantage. I know when I stepped into the gymnastics gym that I was perceived as a deduction because of my flat feet or my bow legs or having a bit of a body, a butt, and having more of a muscular athletic physique. It chokes me up just because <clears throat> the culture and the sport of gymnastics made young African-American girls like me feel as if we were not enough and that it was not a sport for us. But she says the times have changed. Oh, money! Today it's a little different with the scoring system changing. I love the fact that you have the likes of Simone Biles that's dominated. Gabby Douglas has been an inspiration. And now black gymnasts are excelling in the sport in unprecedented ways. I know these young women are part of this university. They know they're more than enough. They are strong, they are empowering. Today, this groundbreaking team says it's not just about the sport, it's about the sisterhood. I had never met these girls a day in my life, and it was like we were laughing and joking around as if we've known each other our whole lives. It's very exciting because it's like we're making history. This is in the books. We have something to prove, and we can do what y'all can do, and we can show up and show up. Showing up and showing out, they are doing. Every NBA All-Star Weekend, we watch big-name athletes LeBron and Giannis do what they do best. But this year, it was a 24-year-old player who Steph Curry called unreal that really stole the show with a slam dunk. Our Will Reeve has more on the All-Stars and Mac Attack. NBA All-Star Weekend ending with its showcase game. Team Giannis taking down Team LeBron 184 to 175. The game's most valuable player? Jason Tatum. Tatum scoring 55 points in the win, the most ever in an All-Star game. Be able to wear my signature shoe today and, and break the record and, uh, you know, take the home this award of somebody that, you know, I idolized, uh, you know, it's a hell of a day. The format's slightly different this year. Team captains LeBron James and Giannis Antetokounmpo drafting their teams live right before the game. Another highlight of All-Star Weekend, the dunk contest, won by the unlikeliest of heroes. Mac McClung is short by NBA standards at six foot two, and he's played just two NBA games in his career. But in high school, he was a dunking sensation on YouTube. Just before All-Star Weekend, McClung signed with the Philadelphia 76er. And on Saturday night, he was a giant. Matt McClung has saved the dunk contest. Three of his four dunks earning him perfect scores and new fans. Steph Curry tweeting, man was a viral high school dunk phenom still working his way to the league. But let me go get that dunk contest trophy right quick and bring it back to life. Unreal. Hashtag Mac McClung. Our thanks to Will. What a weekend for McClung. He got $100,000 for winning the dunk contest, nearly matching his career NBA earnings. Before we go tonight, we go back to our lead story of the night for our image of the day. President Biden and Zelensky walking the streets of Kyiv as all too familiar air raid sirens blare in the background. The U.S. showing a strong show of resolve as the world nears the one-year mark of Russia's invasion. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, how a landmark case could determine who's responsible for certain content posted online and at fault if it's harmful. And looking back at the life and on-screen legacy of actor Richard Belzer. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings.
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Chicago, I'm Alex Perez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Health concerns and outrage continue to grow in East Palestine, Ohio, more than two weeks after the train derailment and toxic spill there. Residents are reporting a growing number of ailments from rashes to nausea to trouble breathing. The state will open a special health clinic tomorrow. The Supreme Court is set to consider a landmark case tackling whether social media sites should be liable for harmful content posted on their platforms. Tomorrow morning, lawyers for the family of the only American killed in the 2015 Paris terror attack will argue for permission to sue YouTube's parent company, Google, for helping to spread ISIS propaganda that allegedly radicalized the terrorist who gunned down their daughter. An explosion at a metal foundry plant in Ohio left 14 people injured, including at least one person in critical condition. Firefighters said late today that most of the fire has now been extinguished, but debris is scattered throughout the area. The cause of the explosion is still unknown. Next to President Biden's unprecedented visit to Ukraine, the high-stakes trip was without advance notice and to show solidarity with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky as we approach one year since Russia began its invasion. Our senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce reports from Poland tonight. President Biden tonight arriving back in Poland after making history in Ukraine. The first American president in modern times to visit a war zone where the U.S. has no military presence. The trip shrouded in secrecy. Biden slipping out of Washington early Sunday under the cover of darkness. Flying not on Air Force One, but on a small C-32, its blinds drawn. Once in Poland, the president whisked to a nearby train, where for 10 hours he traveled undetected into the heart of Ukraine. Arriving in Kyiv early this morning, the city streets blocked off for the surprise visitor. President Zelensky and his wife waiting for him. Good morning, Mr. President. Welcome. That handshake a sign of an unbreakable bond. This is my eighth trip. And everyone in Western this is we're here to stay. The president sharing a message with the Ukrainian people, writing, I am honored to be welcomed again in Kyiv to stand in solidarity and friendship. What can I say? I really appreciate that President Biden, American society been from the very beginning of this tragedy, from the very beginning of this full-scale war, from the first days being together with us. Biden saying he wanted to make this trip to show and not just tell the world that America's support for Ukraine is unwavering. I thought it was critical that there not be any doubt, none whatsoever, about U.S. support for Ukraine in their war against the brutal attack by Russia. Then something that not long ago would have been unthinkable. Biden and Zelensky walking together through the free streets of Kyiv, the same streets Vladimir Putin was closing in on just a year ago. One year later, Kyiv stands and Ukraine stands. Democracy stands. The Americans stand with you. The two leaders visiting St. Michael's Monastery. 
as they exit a harsh reminder of the realities of life in this war-torn city. Those air raid sirens blaring, a warning to take cover. But the leaders defiant, continuing their tour, visiting the Wall of Remembrance, honoring the Ukrainian lives lost in the fight against Russian aggression, taking in a moment of silence, pierced by those sirens. The risk of this trip weighed heavily on the White House. After assessing the danger for weeks, the president Friday giving the go-ahead. Russia, we're told, was informed of Biden's visit just hours beforehand, an attempt to avoid any potential miscalculation or further conflict. Today, before he left, a promise. Remind us that freedom is priceless. It's worth fighting for for as long as it takes. And that's how long we're going to be with you, Mr. President, for as long as it takes. We'll do it. Thank you. Uh, Promising that the U.S. is in it for the long haul, our thanks to Mary Bruce. Now to Georgia and the decision that former President Jimmy Carter shared over the weekend. He's now receiving hospice care and plans to spend his remaining time at home with his family. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. He is the longest living American president in history at 98 years old, well into the sunset of his life. But his announcement over the weekend was still surprising that former President Jimmy Carter has decided to spend his remaining time at home with his family and receive hospice care instead of additional medical intervention. This is a former president who could have retired to a comfortable life, but instead chose to fly around the world with the former first lady, ending diseases, Very good. encouraging free elections, and building houses for the poor, even when he hurt his eye after a fall at their home. I had a number one priority, and that was to come to Nashville to build houses. His family tonight says he's recently had a series of short hospital stays, but it's unclear if it's related to the skin cancer that he fought for years. And as if to tell the world that he's never leaving, after every health concern or rumor, he would appear at parades in his hometown, looking right into the cameras. He's just touched so many lives. Every single time I have interfaced with him, he always said two things to me. Thank you for what you're doing to make the world a better place. And what can I do to support you? No doubt this will be a difficult part of their journey together for the former first lady. And what will now likely be his final television interview, he told me on their 75th wedding anniversary that she was the son in his day. What advice do you have for people who want to make it last? Well, let me take the first step. First of all, choose the right person to marry. Having Rosen staying with me all this long has been the most wonderful thing in my life. He's pretty wonderful in my life, too. What a nice love story. Our thanks to Steve for that. In Los Angeles, authorities have made an arrest in the murder of an auxiliary bishop. Bishop David O'Connell was shot and killed in his home. He served the Archdiocese of Los Angeles for 45 years. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has the latest. Tonight, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department saying they have a suspect in custody in connection with the shocking murder of a beloved Catholic bishop, David O'Connell. The person of interest was identified as Carlos Medina, a 65-year-old male Hispanic. This is the husband of the bishop's housekeeper, and the suspect had previously done work around the bishop's residence. The suspect's home raided by SWAT teams overnight. On Saturday afternoon, the 69-year-old was found murdered in his bed at his home in Hacienda Heights, about 20 miles east of Los Angeles. A single gunshot wound to his chest. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Originally from Ireland, O'Connell was ordained to serve the L.A. Archdiocese in 1979, working extensively with the immigrant community, serving as chairman of a task force coordinating help for immigrant families from Central America. He wants to have justice and peace for all races of people. He was known for his sense of humor and as a peacemaker. Parishioners stunned by the news. He's just a beautiful human being. It's just hard to believe anybody would even consider hurting him in any way. Our thanks to Mac Upman. 
A massive prolonged winter storm is heading across the country tonight, putting 70 million Americans in 20 states on alert for snow, blizzard conditions, and high winds. Already in Grand Forks, North Dakota, drivers saw whiteout conditions on the highway. And in St. Paul, Minnesota, the snow is already coming down and could be measured in feet by the end of the week. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey, Lindsay. While well, there will be little appetizers of snow as we go through the week from the northern Rockies to the northern plains, the big one really gets wrapped up on Wednesday through Thursday. So that's where we're going to focus our timing. That track of the storm takes it right through Wyoming, South Dakota. As you watch the time go by here, Minnesota and Twin Cities specifically really starts to get the bulk of their snow. That's Wednesday night through Thursday. That's when they could get a foot, foot and a half on top of what you, whatever you've already had. This could end up being one of their biggest snowstorms in the Twin Cities on record. In the Green and White Mountains, you'll get some of the snow. At the coast here, it'll be mostly rain, but it looks like we could have a bit of icing or wintry mix, so we'll keep an eye on that for the end of the week. But I do want to mention and put your eye toward Los Angeles. That would be snow, potentially in the Hollywood Hills. Like, the snow levels could drop as low as 1,000 feet. 1,500 feet is about where that Hollywood Hills sign sits, so just to give you some perspective. Uh, a foot plus, and then on the southern end, Chicago, watch that icing. If that becomes an issue, we will be hitting that harder through the week because that'd be more like a Wednesday deal, and then Southern Michigan too. Meanwhile, we're looking for all time February record heat in the Southeast. Orlando, Atlanta, Raleigh, among the cities could see some of those numbers top anything we've done before. And tomorrow will be one of the warmest Mardi Gras on record. Lindsay? Snow in LA, 82 degrees in Washington, DC. Just scratching my head over here, yeah. Ginger. Our thanks to you as always. You should, <laughs> thanks. Acclaimed journalist Maria Ressa's work covering the Philippines government and the allegations of its human rights abuses led to a Nobel Peace Prize for her reporting. She joins us today as the Philippine government continues to levy lawsuits at her and her news outlet, Rappler, which she co-founded in 2012. Maria, we thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for having me. So your reporting in the Philippines in some ways represents trends happening globally and the idea that democracies and democratic rights and norms are really in decline. There are 34 liberal democracies in 2021. That's the lowest number since 1995. And the Asian Pacific has declined in levels of democracy not seen since 1986, according to Varieties of Democracy Institute at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Tell us what's happening in the Philippines and, and why the rest of the world needs to pay attention. So look, I think, you know, there has been a trend, but what was the spark that essentially was set the kindling on fire was really technology. Uh, what technology has done, social media companies, primarily at the beginning, this is around 2014, they're American companies, but now of course you have Chinese companies joining in, TikTok coming in, right? So these social media platforms essentially took over as the gatekeepers from from, from journalism, from news organizations. So we were held accountable for keeping the public sphere safe from lies, safe from falsehoods, alternate realities. Once technology companies took over, um, lies by design now spread at least six times faster than facts. That has turned the incentive structure upside down, the election of more illiberal leaders all around the world. It's bottom up exponential lies where the interests of the social media companies, these technology companies that make more money through this, and the interests of power of dictators to be people who have no consciences, man insidiously manipulate that bottom up is then met top down with the same meta narratives and lies. And you're right in the middle of several lawsuits from the Philippine government. You and your team at Rappler actually have go bags ready to leave at any moment. What is the government there doing to you and, and your team? I think you're seeing this happening all around the world. Uh, right now in, in India, a documentary that the BBC did that the government didn't like had tax collectors coming, going through their offices. It's the weaponization of the law. It's the, the weaponization of free speech to attack those who are trying to hold power to account. That inevitably puts journalists on the front lines, but we're not alone. Human rights activists are, are hounded the same way, and it's the methodology is the same. Are you concerned at all for, for your life? Do, do you fear for your safety? It's been, you know, we've been living with this since 2016. 
Um, in 2018, the government uh, investigated us in 14 different initiatives. We've learned to cope, to deal, but as you can see, this isn't just happening in the Philippines. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists reported that journalism deaths increased by 50% from 2021 to 2022. Why are governments and people in positions of power cracking down on journalism? We're the front lines for facts. If you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. If you don't have these, you don't have a shared reality, you cannot have democracy. Democracy isn't just about people yelling and screaming at each other. It's also about taking the time to listen, to come up with a shared reality, and find the right compromises going forward. Now, you actually grew up here in the United States. You moved here uh, when you were 10 after martial law was enacted in the Philippines. Uh, we had the State of the Union recently. Are you concerned about what's happening in the United States with regards to democratic institutions? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. <laughs> Essentially, what Russian disinformation did in the 2016 elections, and you have a thousand page Mueller report with numerous footnotes looking at this, you know, it was able to bypass institutions and attack American citizens at the core. So essentially, it is the molecules of democracy, the individual citizens whose ideas of fact and fiction, uh, well, first they were enraged, fear, anger, hate, chasms in society and identity politics, Black Lives Matter attacked on both sides. The goal wasn't to, to push forward anything. The goal was to tear society apart using identity politics, which in many instances just was the spark on the kindling. America being as weak as it was, the election of Donald Trump led to massive repercussions, including here in the Philippines. You know, of course, all of these changes are worse on the global south. We absorbed the losses because our institutions were weaker. But what we saw in the United States is that, my gosh, it, your institutions aren't as strong as we had hoped and as certainly as you need. Where America goes now in the next few elections is going to be where the world goes. So good luck. The U.S. military has made investments in the Philippines. Do you think that the U.S. should put more requirements on countries that it gives aid or, or where it has a military presence? I think we're moving from the age of, you know, what 9-11 did was it pushed us into a post-Cold War period. That changed the way security structures thought. Then once we moved to this area of asymmetrical warfare that these types of groups can actually tear down governments, structures of governance, what I like to call old power, are now being turned upside down by new power. This is technology. If we don't find the right solutions forward, it will get worse. Fascinating and really at the same time scary stuff that we're talking about here. Maria Ressa, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Actor Richard Belzer, best known for his role as Detective John Munch on Law & Order series, has died. ABC's Lara Spencer has a look at his career, including a few surprise appearances you may not have expected. For more than two decades, he played sharp-tongued, quick-witted Detective John Munch, the king of conspiracy theories, usually sporting those signature sunglasses. Where's the guy who's cooking up bombs in the kitchen sink while writing his insipid missives? Richard Belzer originated the character in 1993 on Homicide, Life on the Street, set in Baltimore, before bringing Munch to New York City's Law & Order Special Victims Unit. Civilian. And who does this look like, folks? Here's a clue, non-gun hand held to the side. A cop. Pow. The character frequently popping up on other shows, like the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. You were interviewing her out in the open? A Munch lookalike Muppet even appeared on Sesame Street. While he was best known as a TV detective, Belzer first found stardom on stage as a stand-up comedian. Is my hair all right? My hand is caught in my hair. Wait a second, oh! So what happens when you don't blow dry. <laughs> but it was law and order that made him a household name. Had a great time with him today. <laughs> him a major life lesson. Always question authority. Oh, what a
what a surprise. Fans and Belzer's former castmates are mourning his passing. Mariska Hargitay writing, I will miss you, your unique light, and your singular take on this strange world. I feel blessed to have known you and adored you and worked with you side by side for so many years. Christopher Maloney posting this photo, writing, Goodbye, mon ami. I love you. You think what I'm thinking? We've been had. And Ice-T, who played his longtime partner on the show, posting, I wake up with the news. I lost my friend today. Bells is gone. I'll miss you, homie. Bye. Richard Belzer was 78. Our thanks to Lara for that. Still much more ahead tonight. Coming up, she was one of the most celebrated female teachers in the Baptist faith until she spoke out against former President Donald Trump. Beth Moore opens up about the backlash and her decision to reveal a deep trauma from her childhood. But next, the desperate search for survivors after deadly landslides and flooding wreak havoc in South America, destroying hundreds of homes. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In earthquake ravaged Turkey and Syria, a 6.4 earthquake today toppled more buildings and injured people on both sides of the border. Turkish authorities have recorded more than 6,000 aftershocks since the devastating earthquake two weeks ago, but today's was by far the strongest. In Israel, tens of thousands of protesters gathered in Tel Aviv and other cities for a second straight week to rally against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plan to overhaul the country's legal system. The reforms would allow a simple majority in the Knesset to overturn Supreme Court rulings. They also seek to change the way judges are selected and remove independent legal advisors from government ministries. And in Brazil, hundreds of rescuers are searching for survivors after landslides and flooding killed at least 36 people in Sao Paulo state. The area was deluged with nearly 24 inches of rain in one day, one of the highest amounts ever in Brazil in such a short period. Local officials say at least 40 people are still missing and nearly 800 people lost their homes in the torrential rains. For nearly three decades, Christian teacher Beth Moore has traveled the world educating women about scripture in sold-out arenas and writing best-selling books. Her life took a turn after she criticized former President Donald Trump, resulting in her leaving the Southern Baptist denomination in 2021. In her new book, All My Knotted Up Life, she opens up about the sexual abuse she experienced in her childhood, navigating her role as a woman in the Southern Baptist Convention, and her eventual decision to leave it for the Anglican Church. Beth Moore joins us now to talk more about her new book. Thank you so much for being here. I am so honored that you would have me. Thank you. So you talk about how you felt early on uh, that you were straddling this thin line to, to try to fit in. Um, and, and I'm curious because you were getting so much attention as a woman in the Southern Baptist uh, uh, denomination. If you ever felt earlier 
like you might want to leave prior to the whole Access Hollywood, and we'll get into that in a moment. Oh, well, there were times that I would reason to myself, mm. okay, this seems off to me. This seems, that really feels like disesteem to me. Mm. But I would reason, and this sounds so crazy to someone who does not have an eye into this world that can, can get what some of this is about, but I, I tried to reason over and over. Now, th the reason why he is acting that way, or they are acting that way, is because of scripture. Mm -hmm. Because there is that, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna be sort of hands off toward, uh, toward anything that has to do with women and anything that has to do with women in ministry. There's just not gonna be the same esteem. But it's not because they lack respect for us, it is because it's somehow in their head that this is how authority runs in the church. So it wasn't until I began to go, wait a second, I don't think that this is about scripture. I think this is about power. The Southern Baptist Convention, of course, has been accused for decades of allegations of sexual misconduct and, and cover-ups. What was your reaction when you first heard that? Well, this was exactly it, because when I watched so many champion Donald Trump in October of 2016. I mean champion. I'm not talking I'm not talking about your voters. I understand why votes were cast the way they were on both sides. I'm talking about championing him. You do not know anyone well who has been assaulted and grabbed or raped or or taken physically without consent or invitation. You don't know them because you don't know the kind of cost there is. And so there's that. And then soon after that, here comes the sexual abuse crisis. And it's like, okay, then this in October of 2016 was not an anomaly. This is, wait, wait a second. There is no world in which objectifying women is okay. You had prior to this book talked about being sexually abused, but you had never named no. your abuser as your dad. That's right. A and you talk about at some point your, your protector became your perpetrator. Yes. What made you decide that now you needed to, to specifically name your dad? What is clear to me is that that this subject matter has remained so general that people don't know the pain of it and the, the cost of it to the victim. And so it, it was important to me to put some color in it, place it in a home, give that home an address and a yard and a street mm. and understand what it is like to be in, in, in secret where you feel like you carry all of this shame. When we in our churches or our homes care more about protecting our power than our people, we are in desperate need of reformation, but not to mention repentance. And that's what I feel like I wanted to say is, okay, maybe in general terms, it's not enough for you to see the pain that is associated with people who claim to know Christ and they abuse people using him as a screen to do so. Mm -mm. You've said before that you had felt that you needed to apologize yes. for your presence as a woman. Yes. I'm wondering if now that you've left, if you no longer feel that, if you're no longer shrinking to other people's expectations, and, and also what's next for you? What is, because you said you've lived the majority of your life, but you still have some time left. Yes. What is the calling that, that's on your life? Well, preaching, preaching maybe? Well, I tell you this, there is a freedom with, that comes with having been just publicly hated by a whole lot of people because either it kills you or you stop being manipulated by it. I can sort of just be myself. So there's that, there is a certain amount of freedom there. And uh, otherwise, as far as the future is concerned, I just so much wanna serve people. I, I love to see somebody that thinks that there is no hope for her, uh, thinks that there's no way out of, a, of a, a place where she has been harmed or minimized or had her dignity taken from her. I just want her to know how valuable she is and who she is to her maker. 
but we see your service to people in this book. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time oh, and for the words and the pages here. All My Knotted Up Life will be released tomorrow and available wherever books are sold. And still to come, a high school's passion for basketball is motivating more than just her teammates. How she's overcoming a major challenge to stay on the court. Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charging a sweeping 56 count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not gonna let that happen on our watch. Not with hip hop music, using our lyrics. We're gonna fight back. Rap, trap, hip hop on trial. Only on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary news-making year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Aliesburg High School in Virginia is overcoming all odds and isn't letting anything keep her off the court, not even a rare form of bone cancer. And her love and passion for basketball has motivated the entire community in a big way. Reporter Scott Abram at our partner station, WJLA, has her story. They play the two-man game. It's another day of practice for the Heritage High School girls basketball team. Let's get it. Senior Rocky Alardo is not wearing a jersey. She hasn't been allowed to play since the eighth grade. I've had cancer four times, so I've done treatment three out of those four times. Over the last couple of years, Rocky has had numerous rounds of chemo and radiation, battling Ewing sarcoma, a rare type of bone cancer. It was hard living in the hospital. I think you had to be mentally strong. You could do pick and roll with Yana or Caitlin. Through it all, her commitment to the team and her teammates never wavered. She's always been like that role model for me, I guess, because every time I see her, she's always making me laugh, no matter like what she's been through in that day. Rocky! Rocky! And then it happened. Rocky! Senior night against Rockridge. Rocky returning to the court for one last time. I just wanted to play like my one possession. Shoot it, Rocky! The final seconds ticking away just before the buzzer. Rocky throwing up a shot from beyond the three point line. Sometimes you just know what's going in. Like you can just feel it. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is gonna go in. I got very emotional, which I am now, because she, she fought. She fought hard. It turns out her first ever high school shot was her best shot. Love that she shot that shot. Our thanks to Abram for that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. We'll be right back. Come along. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight.